detection channel summation a low complexity practical solution, which will be provided by Professor Emmanuel Viterbo from Monash University. Uh, so let me have a brief introduction of Emmanuel. Emmanuel Viterbo receives the PhD degree in the electrical engineering from the Polytechnic of Turin, Italy in 1995. He is currently a professor with the ECSE department and associate dean of graduate research with Monash University, Australia. Uh, he has been an ISI highly cited researcher since 2009. His main research interests include the lattice codes and the outbreak coding theory, the digital terrestrial television broadcasting, uh, digital magnetic recording, and the irregular sampling. He is an associated editor of the i 2 transactions on information theory, and he is also a guest editor of the i 2 JSTSP. TSP. Uh, so let's have a warm welcome for Professor Emmanuel Viterbo for his market talk. Uh, so okay. Emmanuel, I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, share my slides. I hope you'll see them now. Okay, okay. So uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to give this talk. And uh, it's always a pleasure to give the talk after Ronnie because he sets all the background. And so I can tell you some more practical, uh, uh, top discuss some more practical topics that are uh, certainly very interesting for uh, people developing applications. Um, the, so I, this, uh, this talk was uh, uh, the result of our work. And I would like to thank Taraj, Raviteja, and E uh, for uh, developing many of the topics in, in, in that I discuss here. In particular, we will see the plan for the talk is, uh, well, just to touch again, based on a few concepts about the delay Doppler communication and the, this uh, concept that the channel can be visualized uh, in the delay Doppler plane simply by its, uh, the, each path is, uh, is, uh, is one uh, bump in the delay Doppler plane. And uh, you can see in the picture here, the transmitter is, uh, and the receiver is the gray car. So the, um, the, uh, the, the corresponding paths have different uh, intensity, and that's the size of the circles in the delay Doppler plane. And then the, um, the fact that every, these, these, scat these scatters are moving uh, gives us a different Doppler shift. Uh, depending on the speed of each of the scatters. And this, uh, now it's one important concept that is that this uh, captures a scene uh, instantaneously, or let's say uh, for the time you, you take a picture of the scene, uh, you get this, this channel. But if you take a picture, let's say a few seconds, maybe a fraction of a second later, maybe one second later, you see the cars have moved so in that situation, the, the, the channel has changed, okay? So the delay Doppler channel has changed, but the scale at, this, at which this change happens is much, much slower than, uh, than uh, um, what would happen if we were looking at the channel in time and frequency. So I think Ronnie explained this concept uh, already, but look, I, I like to visualize it in, in these two pictures. Uh, so the good news is that we can embed pilot and estimate the channel at the same time within each frame. So we, we have the, a current frame uh, est channel estimation for that frame, and then we can, uh, we can use it to do the detection. So the, um, the, the real differentiator of OTFS is that um, the information symbols are placed in this delay Doppler domain. Now that's that's uh, an abstract domain. We will see, but the um, the it's a good domain because it's where the channel is uh, has the least uh, number of parameters. It can be described in the sparsest possible way because 
once you know the, the scatters where they are and the, the, the delay between uh, transmitter and receiver uh, across each path, and the speed of the scatterers, you, you know uh, and enough about the channel to use uh, this delay Doppler communication. So the plan for, for today is uh, the following. Let me just clean one thing, uh, clear all the drawings. Okay. Um, so we'll just see a few general uh, concepts about delay Doppler, time frequency, and, and time domains. I'll go a bit faster on that. Okay, <laughs> I need to clean that. Um, and then um, we'll just see a bit of the, the uh, difference between uh, this ideal uh, pulse shapes versus rectangular pulse shapes that was in the first version, uh, was discussed in the first way, was the, the first uh, um, way the OTFS was presented. Um, and then we will go into the Represent the input output relation using the, the discrete ZAC transform, which is this uh, is just a discrete version of the ZAC transform discussed by Ronnie. And uh, we'll show that in, in the, the using the discrete ZAC transform, it's quite natural to see how the system works. And we can see parallels with uh, what happens when you're using OFDM time and uh, signals in time and then the corresponding in frequency. Here we, we in, uh, in OTFS, based on the discrete ZAC transform, we will see signals in times, which are the pulse zones that Ronnie uh, illustrated. And then the corresponding, uh, the, instead of the frequency domain, we're gonna use the delay Doppler, which is now it's a two dimensional domain. So it's not just 1D, but it's a 2D. And, in OFDM, we are used to visualize uh, the, the spectrum as uh, many sync pulses. Uh, these, these sync pulses are all orthogonal. Now, the, the magic thing is that in the delay Doppler domain, these, are, these pulses look like, the, look like these uh, sync pulses, but they are two-dimensional. I'll show you some pictures of that. And so you can kind of relate to, to, to the delay Doppler domain as a two-dimensional uh, transform domain where, where uh, things look, just look similar to what you're doing in, in uh, OFDM. But the, the other thing I wanted to spend a few words about is uh, the different variants of, of OFDM, of, of OTFS. So we've, we've talked about, uh, um, I mean, the, the basic version is the one where we don't need any um, cyclic prefix uh, or, uh, or zero padding. Uh, but there are other versions where we can, we can insert uh, CP and ZP uh, in different places. So we'll, we'll just go through the different types and there are pros and cons of, of each one of them. So we'll discuss a bit of that. And then the... the the next thing is the low complexity iterative detector, which is this uh, maximum ratio based on the iterative maximum ratio combining decision feedback equalization, which is naturally coming from the, 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 the interpretation of the OTFS in using the discrete ZAC transform. So the, the, um, the good thing is that the, when we look at things in, uh, in this, the, the, there is another domain we are particularly interested in, is, uh, is just the delay time domain. Uh, and the delay time domain is, is halfway between the delay Doppler and the time domain. It's just uh, still in a two-dimensional plane. And there, when we write the input-output relation, uh, the, the matrix relating input and output in delay time domain, turns out to be sparse, uh, more sparse than, than what it is in the delayed Doppler domain. And that makes uh, the equalizer uh, complexity lower than, than if we did equalization fully in the delayed Doppler domain. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the the uh, final, well, the, the, say the conclusion is that of comparing different uh, the different variants and the different uh, 
type of, of uh, detectors. Well, we, we kind of came up with our conclusion that inserting the ZP between each block uh, provides the lowest complexity on the detection. And, um, and in, in conjunction with the fact that we also need to insert pilots uh, into the, into the, um, into the uh, transmitted frames to, to estimate the channel. When, when you consider that you have to insert pilot, there is an overhead to insert the pilots. And that overhead uh, is equivalent to just inserting uh, zero padding in each of the blocks. So I'll show you exactly that, what I mean about that. So you can find the, uh, the MATLAB code of, of most of the things I will talk about today uh, in, on our website on OTFS. And uh, then you can, um, you can download it and, and try uh, th how, how things work. And sometimes it's easier to, to read the MATLAB code if you, if you get lost in the equations, okay? So I'm happy if you try. And then as, uh, uh, sorry, got stuck. Uh, stop. Try to press with the mouse on the page. It happened to me also as well. Okay, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, so then coming soon, it's uh, so early next year. We'll have uh, um, we've written well during lockdown. We 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 were busy writing up this uh, all what we learned about the del about delayed Doppler communications from OTFS and. Uh, uh, it should be soon in next year, you, you may uh, see our book appear. So we are still uh, waiting for some uh, corrections. Okay, so I will, many things are, I will mention are, are going to be in, in that book. So the, the, um, let's go back to the original OTFS modulation, uh, how it was first presented in, in uh, 2017. Um, that's the first time I, I, I heard the, uh, the presentation myself, so I was very excited and I, I thought it was worth uh, looking at and trying to understand what was going on, and it's, it was really interesting uh, experience. The, the um, well, the, the basic, uh, the way it was presented was in stages, right? So because, because the delayed Doppler uh, domain was not so familiar at that time, it was actually a great idea to, to rely on the time frequency domain as uh, the intermediate place where people know what, what uh, signals look like, okay? So the, the idea was to think of the delay doppler, the, um, of the time frequency in, in uh, signals in time frequency plane, and then pre-code in a, uh, by this uh, two-dimensional transformation uh, into a, this delay Doppler domain, which is uh, also two-dimensional. And then uh, we know how to transfer from time frequency plane into time domain, and that's a typical uh, OFDM modulator does that. So you go, you go from 2D in delay Doppler to 2D in frequency time, and then you put that all together and you, you, you go into a pure time domain. The time domain signal goes through the physical channel and it gets received. Well, there you have that like uh, the conversion from time to time frequency. And then you do the inverse um, of the precoding operation, which was this uh, SFFT, the symplectic transform to go back to the delay Doppler domain. So here are just the, the equations of these blocks, but what, what I want you to look at uh, about them is, is the fact that we are going from two-dimensional samples. If, if you are, I don't know if you, do you see my cursor uh, moving or? or uh, yes. You see it, okay, so good. Okay, so what, what you see here that I'm taking the samples in time frequency and then uh, there is a double sum, I'm adding them all up. Uh, each sample is uh, multiplying a, 
a transmitted pulse, uh, GTX, uh, which is shifted in time and uh, shifted in frequency. And that's what typically uh, an OFDM modulator does. And this, is, this was called the Heisenberg transform operation. The, the corresponding at the receiver, the, what we have is like a match filter, a two-dimensional match filter, which tries to match uh, the receiver, um, the, the received uh, signal R of T with, uh, um, with a received match filter pulse, which is shifted uh, by in time and in frequency. And then you sample as, as, uh, and, and get the corresponding time frequency uh, samples. So ideally, we, we would love to see this, right? That in time frequency, I, I say any samples I transmit in time frequency uh, is just scaled by, by uh, a coefficient. And, uh, and, and then uh, you receive just a scaled version of uh, a complex scaled version of what you transmitted there. Now, this is ideal because these pulses, GTX and GRX, are not perfectly biorthogonal. And it's a consequence of the, uh, the, the fact that you cannot localize perfectly in time and frequency. So this is, let's say, an ideal, an ideal uh, proposition there. So this is, is not true. You cannot realize it in, in practice. So as, uh, as Ronnie has explained, but in, in reality, uh, we, we have a different uh, uh, interaction. And unfortunately, when you go and represent that in, uh, in this domain, you, you actually see that th there is not a single tap equalizer, a single tap equalization is not possible in time frequency domain. Because the, the, there is, let's say in, in the language of OFDM, you, you are facing inter-symbol interference and inter-carrier interference at the same time, due to the, the fact that the channel is, has the delay and Doppler uh, Multipass. So the the um, the um, corresponding uh, transformation the, in uh, uh, that we do to go from time frequency to delay delay Doppler is uh, is called the the inverse. Sorry, from delay Doppler to time frequency is the inverse symplectic uh, Fourier tra Fourier transform, and you see it's a two-dimensional Fourier transform where the, the word symplectic is because of this minus sign here. So this minus sign is uh, justifies, I think, the, the term symplectic. But uh, really, you just, if you just look at it, in, you may be familiar with uh, in image processing, you do two, 2D Fourier transforms um, of, of an image. And this is what, what we are dealing with. We are dealing with two, these two dimensional samples sample signals which could treat them as think of them as just images um, the the corresponding um, the Eisenberg transform then takes all the samples in time frequency and uh, trans and generates the s of t so this is just the transmitter the the uh, receiver we have uh, we've said it's just the match filter and sample and the corresponding uh, symplectic Fourier transform going from time frequency to delay Doppler is here. And you have the, the minus, if I can get it there, you can see the minus. So this is the direct symplectic fast Fourier transform. And, uh, and the other one was without the minus, it was the inverse. Okay, so keeping the signs the same convention as, uh, as uh, uh, DFT. So what happens is that we have these two-dimensional sampled signals uh, in where you have the time, time frequency samples, Y sub TF, and then you apply this two-dimensional symplectic Fourier transform to get the delay Doppler corresponding two-dimensional signals. Now, if we go to, to, uh, the, to look at the time frequency Resp channel response, which is the one we are familiar with in time and frequency, where that, it, this, this can be related to the delay Doppler uh, channel response by taking the inverse symplectic fast Fourier transform, uh, finite Fourier transform of the delay Doppler. 
which means I am uh, taking the delay Doppler channel samples and then I'm computing this uh, in ISFFT. So when you when you look at it in uh, in uh, in these terms, well, ideal pulses. It we we said we can do single tap equalization. So that's just uh, saying that. But what happens when uh, in time frequency we have this single tap equalization? It means that in the delay Doppler domain, we actually have a two-dimensional convolution. This is in the case of ideal pulses because 2D uh, uh, Fourier transforms, the, the symplectic doesn't really matter, but the two-dimensional Fourier transform satisfy the convolution theorem. So two-dimensional circular convolution uh, in, uh, let's say, in uh, one domain is uh, corresponds to uh, product in the other. So here we have the product in, uh, in the time frequency corresponds to a convolution of the channel with, uh, with the input signal X. So this is a two dimensional convolution. And then if, uh, if you visualize it down here, uh, imagine you transmit X on, in, in, in display. Here this is, you transmit X this is how the delay Doppler channel looks like. As I said, there are a few paths uh, um, which are uh, critical, uh, significant. And then every, every, one, every one pulse that's transmitted in X will, be, will generate its uh, corresponding uh, Y here. So there is different, different things. Now, you can imagine what happens if I put these these transmit pulses, I squash them closer together. Well, there will be uh, inter symbol interference in the delay Doppler domain. In the delay Doppler domain, so the these uh, what I have on the on this side here will be now uh, superposition of many shifted copies of this, and that's another issue with. Bio, I mean, that will make the the detection problem slightly harder, but. This is not the whole story because, uh, unfortunately, this uh, uh, this is a simple convolution, and we said that this ideal situation does not really happen in reality. So, what happens uh, when when uh, well when that does not is not possible? So, when when uh, when the ideal pulses are not <laughs> are not there, well, we actually we deal with finite rectangular pulses and then in that under that condition in time frequency we will be facing intercarrier interference and intersymbol interference now the the good news is that although the the convolution that circular com two dimensional convolution we had before is still there but it's twisted so what is the twist uh, the twist is simple, uh, you, he, before we just had HI, so we just have HI here. Now we have um, HI times uh, phase shift. Now this is a phase shift, which is, is, uh, is time varying, is changing, is changing. So it depends on both M and N. So it's a, it's a 2D convolution with these uh, time varying phase rotations. So that's the that's the addition, that's the twist that comes when, uh, when we are dealing with rectangular pulses. And that's what was called uh, the, the twisted convolution, okay? Now, these, uh, these explicit phase rotations are, uh, are due to the, the, the quasi-periodic uh, structure of the signals and getting, they, they can be, quite easily derived by applying the Zach transform properties. And it's, it's a bit beyond the, it would take a, quite a long time to explain the detail, but they, they have a, a very uh, interesting meaning in, in terms of when you look at them from the Zach transform. So let's see the, um, the matrix formulation because that's maybe uh, the, the way to go to see the, how the transmitter and receiver structure uh, work. So the, the, um, let's start with the, the modulator. So what is the, the ISFFT? Okay, we said it's a two-dimensional uh, Fourier discrete Fourier transform. So 
uh, these FM are the DFT matrices. So I'm taking, when I apply it to my two dimensional signal X, if I multiply it uh, by the DFT matrix on the left, I'm gonna take the Fourier transform, well, the discrete Fourier transform of each column of X. If I post multiply it on the right by uh, this other matrix F, uh, discrete Fourier transform with N points, uh, dagger, which is transpose conjugate, that is the inverse. So it's an inverse discrete Fourier transform applied to the rows of, what's, of, of, of what you have here. So you apply Fourier trans DFT to the columns and IDFT to the rows of X. And that's the 2D uh, transform, symplectic transform. And it's inverse, okay? So the, the corresponding, um, so once you've done that, you've moved, you've, you've, you've uh, mapped your delay Doppler to dimensional signal to your time frequency samples in that, in that domain. And you, you next have to go to the time domain. So that, that step is the Heisenberg transform, which we said it's just taking the, the corresponding time frequency samples applying the, an IFFT, which is what an OFDM modulator does, and then multiplying by the, the GTX pulse, which is uh, just for, for here, we'll just assume it's a, a rectangular square rate pulse. So this would just be an identity matrix. Why? So the, the final step is to, to um, stack all the, all the signal the, that we have into a single vector. So the vector, this is a 2D matrix, okay? We just apply, apply the, um, the vectorization by columns and uh, we, we get the, the time domain uh, vector, sample uh, transmitted uh, signal. Now, if you, if you see what happened, <clears throat> if, you, so if you, we had X of TF uh, and when we substitute it in here, what the, the um, one of the XN will, the, 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 the FM Fourier transform goes away. So when we substitute here, FM and FM dagger cancel out and uh, you just remain with this property. So you have, uh, you take the delay Doppler domain, you apply discrete Fourier transforms along the rows of X, uh, inverse, inverse discrete Fourier transform row along the rows of X, and then you vectorize, okay? So we will call this uh, X times Fn dagger, the X tilde, and that, that's, uh, that is a two-dimensional signal which lives in this uh, domain, which is the delay time domain. And once you vectorize the delay time domain, you get the, only the time domain signal S. If, <clears throat> so what is this now? So let's skip the time frequency altogether and say, um, we, we, we actually start from the delay Doppler X here. This is our delay Doppler two-dimensional signal where we will put our information uh, and directly take the vectorization of X times the, in, the inverse DFT uh, with endpoints. And that's what we call the inverse discrete ZAC transform. Okay, so the nice thing is it's a transform, it's a unitary transform. So all uh, nice properties of, uh, of um, transforms all apply. So I, I want to show you that discussion in this picture because let's say this on the right hand side here. So on this side, we had the, the, the original uh, way uh, OTFS was presented. So it's, uh, it's basically, this is the uh, um, delay Doppler. We start with the delay Doppler here we apply the, the ISFFT, so row we Fourier, inverse Fourier of each row and the Fourier of each column of the resulting thing. We go to the time frequency here and then <clears throat> the time frequency does the, you have the Heisenberg and you go, you get the parallel to serial. You eventually add one 
one little CP at the end of the frame, and then you get the time domain. So what we've shown in the matrix notation is that actually you can you will see here that you are doing you simplify this uh, block the for the FFT uh, along with M points gets simplified. So you just end up with this thing on this side, which is the pure exact transform. Now, just by do, looking at this at the transmitter in this simplified form, you can notice that first of all, we are doing I, just IFFT, a number of uh, IFFTs of length N. So the complexity of the transmitter, if you want, it depends on, uh, on the on the end can be, and if n is smaller than m, you may save a bit on the complexity of the of the transmitter and obviously as well the receiver. The other nice thing is that if you have a, a small n relative to n m, you will have a, even a lower PAPR. So we, we have all that spectrum of choices on m and n depending on the application, but you can see that you can uh, you can uh, uh, play with M and N to pick the sweet spot for which works for your application. Now the other thing here is that no need to put any uh, any CP on each symbol as we would do in a classic OFDM system. So we just need maybe at the end to separate frames, uh, put a CP. So that's that's the the interesting feature of the transmitter. And again, remember the game is, we go from two dimensional signals to a one dimensional signal in time by this inverse Zach transform. What's that the receiver does, just the reverse operation. This is in the matrix form, but the, in terms of, uh, of uh, this, so at the receiver, we have a discrete Zach transform receiver. I'll go down to here directly, which takes the received time domain samples, applies this discrete Zach transform, which means you take the, the vector R, you unvectorize it, so you make it you make it back into um, into a, a two D matrix. And that's that's the delay time version of of of, uh, of the received signal. We call it y tilde. And then you apply to each row of this matrix y tilde the the endpoint DFT. So that that's the discrete Zach transform, and which means in this picture we take the received signal, we uh, remove that uh, CP or ZP anyway guard, um, and then. We stack the columns, all these, each block we'll put into the columns, and then we do the FFT along each row. And that's the received symbol. So uh, you get the received symbols here, which will uh, be just distorted versions of the transmitted ones. And the, the game is to, to then recover the, the information symbols, which were trans embedded in the delay Doppler domain. So just a, a little uh, little hint of the discrete Zach transform, the form of it, and uh, and um, possibly you you may I'm not sure, but maybe this is the way to to actually work out the relation to the Cooley Tuki uh, um, fast Fourier transform algorithm uh, with its relation with Zach. I'm not sure, but this, if you want to have a go, probably this is the way to, to try it. The answer is uh, yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, great. great. So the, um, the, the, the game here is, what is this Zach transform? Okay, so we said it goes from 2D to 1D. So we, we have our X of MK, uh, this is mm, the delay Doppler uh, QAM symbols, as as uh, as and it's really just uh, doing the the um, it's a DFT an endpoint DFT okay applied to each row of of uh, of uh, of the matrix X as as we saw in the definition and then we what we do with that is we we concatenate all the all the rows but with uh, an in interleaved by, by step by n. So you, you, there the, the resulting, because 
remember we wrote into columns and then we do the transforms into the row. So then, then we transmit the columns, okay? So that's the, 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 um, the correspond, there is a row column interleaving in between. So the, the similar thing at the receiver, you do the inverse operation and this is the, the uh, corresponding uh, discrete Zach transform. So in a way, if you look at this, uh, of this uh, scheme here and you replace IDZT with IFFT and you replace DZT with FFT, that's an OFDM symbol, uh, system where we, we were going from time frequency to time through the channel and back to frequency. Here we're going from delay Doppler by this new transform, which is very different from the, just the Fourier transform itself because it's going directly from 2D to 1D. Okay, that's the, that's the, the, the way to think of it. And I'll talk about that interpretation a bit more. Um, yeah, just maybe a quick thought about just refresher of the notion of what, it, what does it mean uh, to take uh, the Fourier transform. So let's think of a signal is just a point in space. Okay, and this is my, this maybe some, these are the samples of a, of a signal with uh, n points. And uh, the, you, you represent your signal along a time basis because that's where you, you can put the point in, your, in, uh, in, uh, in time. Every sample is one, of your, is one of your basis functions and then the coordinates, you can place them in, 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 as a point in space. Now, what is a Fourier transform? It's, simple, it's simply a change of basis. We are just changing the base of, uh, of, uh, of this, that point in space. So we are representing that point in a new coordinate system where the basis functions are the Fourier basis. As we said, the harmonics uh, um, are the new coordinate system. So that's, that's one way of thinking about it. And the, what is frequency is the index of, the, of each harmonic. It, it tells you uh, how you index each, each function in, um, in each sine wave at different frequency in, uh, in the time domain. But so the basis themselves are, the, the Fourier basis are sine waves at different frequency. And, uh, and then you can, uh, you can keep that index and use it as uh, the Fourier uh, representation of the same object, which is this, the physical signal X, which we know lives in time, but we can, uh, we can uh, visualize it in frequency as well, equivalently, no, without any. And the, the nice feature of uh, transforms is that they, when they are unitary, many things work well, like you have uh, the convolution property, uh, Parseval identity. So unitary transforms are good. So what's the what's the Zach transform? Because in a way, this uh, the Fourier basis is nice because we have a one-dimensional signal in time becomes a one-dimensional signal in frequency. Okay, so there is uh, the frequency. The spectrum is uh, is a one-dimensional signal, which has a nice physical meaning as well, and that, that's good. But what, what is happening in Zach transform is that now we, we are uh, using uh, two dimensional signals as a, as a way to represent the, the, the signal X. So, and these two, these, uh, these are the pulse zones that uh, Ronnie e explained uh, before. And essentially they are just pulse trains, okay? This is, these are the ideal pulse trains and modulated by, by a, a complex uh, sine wave at a given frequency. So when you, you, you can think of this, these are the basis functions in time, which are parameterized by two, two values, the, the delay tau zero and the Doppler V zero. These, these, these are the, replacement of the notion of frequency when, if, you, if you think of the Fourier transform. But just think of this. Now, these, these are all mm, time domain signals 
and uh, you can uh, choose different tau zero v zero, they will all be orthogonal. So you have a nice basis of uh, of uh, of signals in time, which are all orthogonal. And, and you can kind of imagine that because you you can uh, you can shift once you shift these uh, Dirac pulses, they will uh, at different uh, with different tau zero, they will not overlap. So you can kind of imagine that they are orthogonal, okay? But uh, this is another, uh, just a 3D picture of the same objects. You see these are, this, tra this pulse train is actually spinning at, at a different uh, frequency determined by the, the Doppler shift V0. So that's, that's the time domain representation of, of the basis functions. Now, I told you, think in OFDM, when, when we, we, our time domain signals are uh, sine waves, okay? And they, they are harmonic of, of the subcarriers, they are at the frequency of each subcarrier. We, are super, we have a superposition of subcarriers, uh, each one modulated by a different QAM symbol, and we transmit that. Uh, here, we, we want to see what's the, what's the subcarrier, uh, what does it look like? in delayed Doppler domain. As much as we know that the, when we look at the spectrum of OFDM, uh, we know that you see the sync pulses, which are nicely orthogonal because each subcarriers will have a sync pulse, which does not interfere with the next one when there is no ICI. So that's the picture you, you may have in mind for OFDM. Now look what happens. What are those sync pulses look like in delayed Doppler domain. So they, they look like two-dimensional sync pulses, okay? And uh, this is just showing the magnitude, but in reality, they have all their own phases, which matter a lot. But to visualize the, the object is um, that each delayed Doppler um, slot, uh, you, you have one, one of these two-dimensional sync pulses, and then you can obviously shift them in, uh, in, um, in, from slot to slot. They will form a nice uh, orthogonal set of two-dimensional periodic sync pulses. So that's the, that's the, the nice uh, picture I, I like to keep in mind to, to explain the, the, what's happening in the delayed Doppler domain, okay? But, but um, then let's go back to our structure of the transmitter and see how we can use the, the fact that if you visualize the transmitter as just a, a, a inverse discrete Zach transform, things become quite simple to, to explain. Okay, so the, the, um, we, let's go back here. We have the delayed Doppler two-dimensional transmitted QAM symbols. You put them in this matrix. You take the rows, each row, I'm going to call it x, uh, little x uh, of from 0 to m minus 1. So I have capital M of them. I'm doing the endpoint FFT of each row, writing it in this delay time domain. And then I'm going to transmit the columns. So uh, what I'm transmitting is our blocks. I have uh, n blocks, each block made of m symbols. Uh, samples. Okay, so this is the transmitter, and then the corresponding receiver is uh, doing the inverse operation. We take the received uh, stream, we undo, well, this has gone through the channel, in which the channel we, we in, uh, in time domain, we can model that, that's an in, we input a vector, and the channel uh, is uh, affecting that vector, transmitting vector S, and the gen, uh, multi by a multiplication by this uh, um, channel matrix in the time domain, we get the corresponding receive vector R. So important that uh, when the operations at the receiver are just the inverse, uh, the exact transform. And then we, from here, we need to do the detection operation. So once we have the samples in delay Doppler, we've seen that the, the channel will, will produce some Mm, severe uh, interference between among all the samples. So uh, we need to recover the, the original signals. 
the original symbols that were transmitted by the, the detection, some detection algorithm. So just to, to, again, to make another parallel with the OFDM symbols, when we talk, when we, we have a, in, time, in time frequency domain, we transmit uh, in, OFDM, in OFDM system, we will have multiple, a number N of uh, OFDM symbols, and they are transmitted, and we call those, uh, each one of the symbols that are transmitted uh, an OFDM symbol. Now, here we are going to we're going to transmit uh, delay time symbol vectors. Okay, that and the difference here is that the in, in the, the in OFDM all the OF, one OFDM symbol is in one block. In uh, on the other hand, uh, when we are dealing with the delay Doppler um, symbols, uh, they they get scattered in time across multiple blocks. So you get this uh, row due to that row column interleaving operation. So that's, uh, that's kind of important to notice because then keeping that uh, working in the delay time allows us to kind of uh, have that ordering of the vectorized vec elements, vectors, in a way that it makes the, the matrix, the channel matrix, uh, very structured and there are nice properties that can be used for detection. So this is just showing that what we transmit are still n blocks of length m, but the actual the, the actual uh, delay time uh, symbols have to be picked jumping uh, by m and shifting by n. So the, 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 the picture of this, maybe it's easier to see it in this example, so we, we have the delayed Doppler vectors. Uh, these are the rows of X, and we've just stacked stack them here. I take the endpoint IFFT, that's the, the inverse Zach transform. Uh, so in this domain, we, I mean, this is the delayed time domain. They are still one after each other. But after the row column interleaver, you can see that you have to go one, one here, one here, and one here. So they get scattered across uh, the entire frame. So that's, that's uh, um, the, the difference uh, with respect to uh, uh, what's happening in a standard OFDM system. So another, another point at this, at this point, then we, we can uh, just uh, discuss a few variants as, uh, as I was mentioning before. So, well, the, let's say the, the, the basic variant, the, the origin, let's say the original uh, form is probably the, the case A. So the case A is uh, where we have the uh, time domain signal and we just need either a CP, which we put in front, which is as long as the, um, the delay spread of the channel or a bit longer than or equal to that. Or we can also put a ZP at the end. And you know, this may have, at the, at the beginning, we, we probably didn't have uh, different people studied different systems and we just want to make them in a, in a, we try to figure out all the variants that were possible. So these were the two basic ones and they are, let's say the core idea can be seen here. But then there was, uh, the, the other, the, what we were looking also at the, is where we insert guard either CP in each sub block, in each block within a frame. So you can put it before each block, you put a CP of, uh, of, of the block, or we can put a zero pad after, after it. So zeros uh, after the samples and transmit that. Now, typically in OFDM, we, add you know we 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 add the the guard the cp is added on so we expand the the duration of the frame that's one typical way of operating but in uh, in um, to make things slightly simpler to to manage it's actually equivalent to to um, insert the cp or zp by removing some 
samples from the transmit, re reducing the transmission rate. So the, the amount of information symbols, we shrink it and leave the space uh, to put, we put some zeros. We say we transmit some zero information symbols in the right place. And so that the corresponding uh, ZP happens within the original length. So these are, uh, so we just named this RCP and RCP stand for reduced CP, which was the obviously the, the initial advantage that we, we, we were happy to see uh, that, that, hey, we are going to save all this CP and ZP uh, of OFDM, which is, which is the second one, the case B. So that the C is just the equivalent. But the, then we'll see that that's uh, actually not uh, as, as advantageous as, as it, it, should, it could be because in fact, we have to put in pilots and the pilots cost some, uh, not some, you need to put some guard symbols around the pilots to, to make the channel estimation relatively simple. And then when you insert that, those guards, you end up having an overhead, which is equipped in, in, if you're using the case A, it is equivalent to using case B when, when you are considering the pilots as well. So here is the, is the picture of what happens in the, in the classic uh, uh, OTFS is the reduced CP case. So you can embed the pilot, but when you embed the pilot, you must make sure that the data does not leak into the pilot, uh, uh, in, uh, affecting the, where the pilot is. And also the pilot must be able to uh, detect the channel uh, and not without any interference from the data. So you, you don't want to, you want to have a, a clean area around the pilot so that the channel can be detected uh, without, without any interference. So you, depending on how much Doppler you have, uh, you can actually have a reduced guard. You, you, have a, you have a smaller region, but if you have a, large Doppler, then you would typically need to, to use the full uh, row of, of, this, uh, of this matrix. And this is the, the delay Doppler uh, domain. Now, when you do this in, uh, with the ZPOTFS, in ZPOTFS, you actually <clears throat> make sure that there, the bottom row, the last row of, uh, of the transmitted symbols is, is set to zero. So you're not transmitting any information there, you're putting zeros, but then when you put the pilot either in the reduced case, but just look at the full guard, you can see that the number of uh, guard symbols is exactly the same as above. So in a way, the, because you need the pilot, it doesn't really change. You, you lose that advantage of uh, the reduced CP. Okay, so maybe I will go more <laughs> quickly on the, on the detection. The, um, the, the, the detection we said is, is not, is this twisted convolution where if you, the, the important thing is when you do the detection is to know exactly what these uh, phase corrections are. If you know those phase corrections, then this becomes a, a classical detection problem where you have Y equal H matrix times X and uh, plus noise. Now this, um, the, the X and Y are the vectorized uh, versions of, uh, of the delay Doppler. So X, little x is the vectorized version of, uh, of X transpose. And the reason why we vectorize it this way and not vectorize X is to be compatible with the Zach transform idea, which is operating on each row. So we, what we do is, vectorize each row and then uh, let's say we are effectively vectorizing this uh, the transpose of, of x instead of the vectorizing the columns of x. Um, so that this is uh, very important because it simplifies a lot the structure of the matrix x, the, the matrix h. You know, this is the, the matrix describing the channel in the delay Doppler domain. So if that now, the good news is that this matrix is, is sparse and it only has, if you have a P paths where the number of paths is uh, 
uh, including paths that have the same delay and multiple Dopplers or uh, same Doppler and multiple delays, the, the, you count all the possible paths in the first picture I showed you of the cars with the cars. So that's the number of paths in, in the scene that matter. Okay, I, I need to maybe clean up a bit. Uh, okay, here, fall. Okay, um, so the, when, you, when you look at it in this form, you know, it, it maybe remind people of the MIMO uh, problem, but the good news is that this H matrix is not a, is not full matrix, it's very sparse. You know, we are talking about an NM times NM matrix. So it's a very, very big matrix if M and M are not too small and uh, definitely much, much bigger than P, which is the number of paths as we, we heard before, maybe 15 paths will do the job, okay? So um, the, the fact that this is sparse immediately makes people think that you can use a nice message passing a detection algorithm. And that was uh, shown, uh, that was the first thing we, we, we tried out and it does work, but it does have, oh no, okay. Uh, obviously complexity as well as much. Of course, uh, other ways, other possible solutions is going directly, try to do MMSE. Remember, this is a very big matrix, but it is sparse. So there are some tricks that may simplify the, a bit this inversion problem, taking advantage of the, of the sparsity. So it won't be this bad, but still is not as good as, uh, as what can be done in other ways. The, the other uh, way of attacking the detection problem is assuming that the, we, work, we go to the, the, the time frequency domain and do a single tap equalization. Although we know it's not accurate, we just live with it and try to, uh, that's, that would be low complexity, but uh, unfortunately it, the performance degrades heavily when the, num the Doppler shifts are large and uh, that, that's, that's uh, is not really effective. The, an, another alternative uh, was also proposed is like parallel inter, inter symbol uh, cancellation. Uh, and that's also has problems with the, with the um, higher Dopplers. Now the message passing that I mentioned before has a serious uh, issue with the, the scaling of, of the, the QAM symbol. So if, if you use it for 4 QAM, it's okay, Q is four, but if you want a 64 QAM, it will hit hard on the complexity of the detector. And also P is, uh, is there. So all the paths are, are important. Now, there was a nice, we, we, we didn't have the car to drive around, but to measure a channel, but we, we had the just indoor. So what we did, is we had the transmitter and the receiver. And uh, so what you see here, we transmit the pulse in delay Doppler domain, and uh, we estimated the channel. Now you see, we get three pulses in, uh, in, with three different delays, and this is uh, just inside the room. It's uh, probably a typical uh, indoor uh, delay, delay profile. Now, what we didn't have any Doppler and we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't move things fast enough to see anything. We added that uh, artificially as uh, by emulated. So we just, uh, if you add a Doppler, you can see that the, um, each pulse actually spreads, uh, has multiple um, bumps uh, along the Doppler. You see there's uh, the, the peak one, but, and then you have the, the, the ones, the side lobes, which are, are also there. And as long as they stick out uh, above the noise, they will be uh, relevant and they will count as, as channel paths in, in the, the number of P. So this P, although it should be, you think it's three, it, it's actually in, when you look at the discrete, uh, in, in this, look at the problem in discrete time, um, you actually get many more than P than, than the three, because because of the, the residual side lobes there. So you, this P is not that small, in, in, especially in the delayed, in the Doppler domain, because uh, yes, 
Um, so the, the solution to that is to, um, to work in, uh, in um, uh, insert the ZP and, uh, and then use the, the, um, this uh, simple um, and maximum ratio combining uh, detector. So the, the, as I said, the ZP doesn't hurt the overhead because we are putting in the pilots. And uh, the, the scheme, as, uh, as I probably already hinted at, is the ZPOTFS. We put a, a, a set of, of uh, zero symbols, uh, the transmitter. So the zeros that are down here at the bottom will end up in, as, as, uh, z, as zero padding in between the blocks, okay? So that we achieve that in this form. And the receive, uh, the, the, when you do that, there are some nice features happening in the, the matrix relating the, trans, the delay Doppler transmit symbols with the received symbols. So this matrix, uh, big matrix here, actually turns out to be by inserting, by putting the zeros here, you put zeros, you get rid of everything outside. Uh, outside this uh, box. So you keep, this is the good one uh, here. So we have this one here. So this, this, uh, this now is a block. It's a block lower triangular and each block of uh, each K block is, uh, is a circulant matrix, which is great because then circulant matrices multiply, multiplying a circulant matrix by a vector uh, is in fact the convolution between uh, between vectors, and then if you do convolutions in the transform domain, you you get simple products. And the transform domain from delay Doppler is the delay time. So we have those delay time sam samples available at the receiver to do that. So I, I probably don't have time to explain to you the the um, the how the MRC detector really works, but it's based on, on that, on the structure of that matrix and on the, <clears throat> on the processing over this graph, which has um, got the, the, variable, the variable nodes are now vectors of uh, OTFS symbol vectors. Um, so rows of the X matrix. These are our variable nodes that we want to estimate. The, the, the QAM symbols, there are, uh, vectors of quant symbols, each one. And then the branches describe which matrices affect those uh, symbols. And what does that do? It spreads the, um, the transmitted symbols across multiple received symbol vectors. Why? So these are the observation nodes, the blue ones. Now the MRC, this maximum ratio combining, what it does, it tries to Pack to collect from each one of the receive of the received symbol vectors, the where there is some information about x zero, we combine them by a maximum ratio combining, and we get a good estimate for for that x zero. Once we have that good estimate, we subtract it. So that's successive cancellation. It's decision feedback uh, cancellation, and we can move on to the next one. Now you can do it once, and then you can iterate multiple times. So the, the advantage of this, I'll just highlight it here, is that now the complexity reduces to NML, and L is just the number of delays. So it doesn't matter what happens to the Dopplers, which often can take up all the N samples because of the fractional Doppler effect. Uh, this is probably the lowest possible complexity because uh, you still need to process, you pro, you're processing the Doppler as vectors, and you don't need to, to dig into uh, the, all the P paths, uh, paths. You just need to know the delays paths. So that's, that's a, the big advantage of that. And um, so I'll skip that. Some, of course, it, you can iterate a number of times to improve, and you can improve convergence on all that. Per Performance-wise, it performs as well and, and with 444 QAM even better than, than the message passing, but uh, essentially as well as the message passing. 
and obviously much better than than uh, no FPM. Uh, the you can do um, turbo, so you put uh, you add a uh, code, uh, and then you just do one iteration of MRC, so ju just one pass, and then you you apply the you decode, you reencode, and you you do it again. This uh, is has very very good performance. It improve you know you can get a sixty four QAM uh, working pretty well, and then. Uh, compared to uh, OFDM, BICM type of approach. And if you, if you don't iterate, you gain. If you iterate, you gain a lot, okay? So if you, a few more iterations. I'll, um, we've, we've done this also for MIMO. So in terms of complexity, it, it can be done for MIMO. MIMO is simply uh, where each one of these uh, channels is a high mobility multipath channel. So you have uh, everything scaling up. And we've recently um, got this uh, letter uh, published about the MIMO case. Um, not so much time to talk about it, uh, but the, the good news is that it's always outperforming the, uh, even the message passing. And there are some reasons for that, but the, um, the, and the complexity is, is still uh, affordable. Um, also, it scales with uh, the QAM size, so you get very good performance for a large QAM. Interesting that when you get the diversity gain of MIMO, so when the number of antenna increases, you even get a higher, better performance. And uh, just recent results, uh, yes, we, we've done um, this the MIMO case, and then the other the other thing uh, we recently have is the uh, a change change in the um, in the ZAC transform the discrete instead of doing discrete ZAC transform where you do uh, endpoint FFT or IFFT uh, we replace that with the Hadamard transform, and that kind of um, reduces the complexity because Hadamard uh, transforms are really simple in terms of comp hardware complexity. And uh, luckily they, the, the performance is the same given uh, under this MRC detection, we get exactly the same performance of, uh, of OTFS. So with a just simplified uh, uh, transmitter structure. So thank you and uh, please uh, you can find codes and stuff in, in, the, in our website. So thank you for uh, uh, your attention. I'm happy to hear some questions. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you for impressive talk. But due to the limited time, maybe we have yeah, uh, maybe we only one on question. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, okay one, uh, one. Yeah. Uh, I'll just select one of the questions. Um, sure. uh, Omid has asked, uh, could you elaborate on how Windowing uh, to co compact against interdoppler interference. Right. So one thing is uh, um, uh, windowing. Windowing in which domain you you want to do it? I don't know. But anyway, let's let's assume if let's say now we are looking at rectangular pulses. So right. we have a rectangular pulse and. Uh, in that case, we, we have exact, uh, the input output relation is, uh, is really, is, has, let's see if I find the, uh, yes. So you see with rectangular pulses, we have the input output relation is that twisted convolution and the twist because the pulses are rectangular is just a phase correction, which is good because it's not, not too bad to deal with. When, when you put, uh, if you don't put a, a rectangular pulse, let's say you put a, you know, a, a, sign, a sign pulse, you are actually going to have um, some problems because then there is also the, the amplitude of, of, that, uh, of, the, of the window, which will, uh, will affect, which in a way you will have uh, different SNR on each sample because of the window. And that's not really desirable because then the performance is always dominated by the worst uh, case sample. So 
it, it has some drawback in, in, when you do non-rectangular non pulse windowing, but it may have, it may, it may have a, a advantage in reducing the ICI, but that our point is if you use MRC detection, fractional Doppler uh, and the spread of the Doppler doesn't affect our detection complexity. So that the fractional Doppler is kind of a, a bit of an artificial notion because you know Doppler is probably not not the channel is not made of direct pulses. Physical channel are probably blurs of 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 scatterers, and um, so that's not really what what we should worry about. But I think that having a detector which is independent of the number of of on the of on the of the spread of the Doppler is uh, is really useful because then uh, you don't care about uh, about the Doppler being spread or not or fractional or non-fractional uh, or if it's even if if you when you pick a small n then your Doppler resolution is very low so you will have Doppler everywhere in all possible in all in all bins so if you when you are in that situation you just don't. Uh, uh, you, you have to you have to deal with that and if you did if you did message passing or other algorithms where, where complexity depends on p you will be hit a lot hard by complexity our point is if you do mrc you do zp or tfs and uh, with the mrc you don't suffer from that so in a way it becomes less uh, of a problem so i would not suggest to do uh, windowing in time Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. Um, there are still quite a lot of questions, but I think sure. most of them in, in, later in the later. panel discussion. Yeah, most, uh, yes. most of the questions are related to the questions we had before. Sure. So it, uh, shall we move to the panel discussion? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's move to the panel discussion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will, uh, please, yes, introduce the uh, uh, Thanks. Sure, okay. <laughs> 